uh, see, do some work on degrowth, degrowth, and uh, degrowth. Yeah, degrowth, and it is very close to Gandhi and Kumarappa. And uh, now the Western scholars has come to the conclusion, and they all agree that they are actually the degrowth, the real root is in India. And very particularly the contributions of Gandhi, Kumarappa, and Devindranath Tagore and others. So I have a plan to organize some kind of a, a seminar, maybe a kind of a webinar or something on the degrowth. What about your center? If your center is, uh, is interested in that particular area, we can think about. Hmm? Yeah, we, we, can think we about are very that. interested and with the help of Anand Bhai and Professor Anand Kumar and Rajmohan Gandhi ji, we can nurture uh, at least one uh, program or in later conference as well. Yeah, yeah. So we we are planning to organize. Yeah. So what I will do, I will send a mail to you. Uh, if uh, if, if uh, yeah. we can we can uh, think about that there to, to a kind of a yeah jointly we can organize something. It, uh, now it is a uh, the the end of this year. We can think about next year. I can also contribute some of the foreign scholars who have done some work on degrowth. Club of Rome uh, can incorporate some of uh, their insights as well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Professor, uh, Professor Andagri, uh, he's waiting for us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Sugamana. Ah, uh, Sugamai Rikin. <laughs> so, the so, so, Satsriya Kal Randi, Salam Alekam, Om Namo Shivaya, yeah. the Lord. And uh, hello, Manashi and Uma, Salam Alekam. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> hello, Uma. So how are you, Professor Jos? Oh, fine. Just linking to this conversation, yes, it is very important. Yeah. And you know, one of uh, my dear friend, uh, Professor Garber, Gerber, who teaches in uh, ISS Holland. Okay. He has co-edited a book on this, which has come out from Orient Lakshwan. Oh. And he has contributed an essay to the political economy book I'm editing. This your forthcoming essay. Okay. So a lot of possibilities for conversation, Gandhi and, and uh, what is uh, important is that this whole idea of degrowth, yeah. you know, also can be opened up to an affirmative imagination. Okay. Because this language degrowth starts quite understandably, okay. you know, as a negation of growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, people, we, people immediately may think in that there we are against all kind of uh, uh, yeah growth and development. That may be a problem. You are absolutely right. But we can kind of you know this like uh, in Buddhism the negation is part of affirmation, and uh, similarly we can think of a new language and degrowth and civilizational transition, and also here bring both African and Latin American perspectives lot of interesting work is happening now with the election of president lula now in brazil and a kind of a, it is not just the left turn but a kind of a life turn in a way the left embodies a series of affirmation of life today you know yeah you are very right today today actually in morning i was reading uh, more details on that boss also family for on that uh, that credit uh, program when he was there, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting program, and uh, we have to do some kind of a, a comparative analysis of our MG and REGA and the Bosdo uh, yeah, familia. Yeah. And the point is that there, you see, we have to take some lessons from that Bosdo. Uh, familiar to India and our uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme has to something to give to Brazil because I have seen that the Brazil, the major point what they mentioned that they are this actually uh, not the constructive work actually without doing uh, this kind of constructive work a certain amount of credit is flowing to their account 
It's a lot of criticism on that. You can think about some kind of a merging with these two things yeah. and with a, with a kind of a conditional uh, cash flow plus a, some kind of a constructive work, both. Right. There are a lot of things to think about that. Okay, I have to stop because already we are reaching the time. Okay, then. So, uh, just give me a minute. I will be just live on our uh, social media platform and then in the meantime, a warm welcome to Minati. <laughs> and other friends present. So now we are live on our uh, Facebook platform. And uh, first of all, on behalf of Viswanidhan Center for Asian Blossoming, I welcome all of you who joined today's very important talk on the very topic, political violence and penalty of evil, Kerala, India and the world. So we will start today's session with an invocation of a song. So let me just uh, share this screen. Thank you uh, so much for your uh, kind attention. I, Randir Kumar Gautam, on behalf of uh, Viswanidhan Center for Asian Blossoming, welcome you to attend uh, today's Swathe Sahachakra Dialogue on the very topic, political violence and banality of evil, Kerala, India, and the world. 
I'm extremely overwhelmed to get this opportunity to welcome you all. Uh, I welcome uh, Professor uh, Jos Chattakulam from Center for Rural Management, Kerala. I welcome Dr. Mansi from the same center, that is Center for Rural Management, Koit, Kerala. I welcome discussant of today's session, Dr. Omar Najruddin Sahab from University of Calicut. Moderator of today's session, Professor Anand Kumar uh, Giri, Minti Pradhanji, and all viewers on our uh, Viswanidan Center for Asian Blossoming. Uh, let me just give a brief introduction to our uh, speaker, Dr. Jos. Chanta Kulam. Uh, he is a director of Center for Rural Management and uh, he is the former chair professor on Decentralization and Development Institute of Social and Economic Change, Bangladesh. He has deep engagement with empowering rural development, his sadhana, and his research is largely based on. and. Uh, he has uh, uh, also evaluated major development projects which have been implemented by different national and international agencies, including Government of India. Uh, he worked with many organizations. He has chaired many uh, institutes, institutional work, and uh, he had been involved in many research, uh, particularly on the issue of uh, poverty, decentralization, development administration, participatory local development, empowering democracy and social movement. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Chatukulam, to uh, accept our invitation to share your thought and wisdom. Uh, I welcome uh, Omar Najruddin, uh, and he is a very eminent uh, writer for, and activist also and uh, he trained from JNU and uh, he delivered three times in our uh, Sadesa Chakra and uh, those were the very uh, some of our best uh, uh, sessions so thank you Dr. Umar Najruddin. Uh, Sadesa Chakra uh, is a kind of circle of learning together, self-culture, societies, and the world. And friends associated with this are eager to work and mediate with new horizons of thinking, new movements of social and cultural change. Uh, at work in our contemporary world, we study seekers such as Sri Aurobindo, Mahatma Gandhi, Chitranjan Das, a creative thinker from Orissa. And we invite uh, people from different fields to share their uh, knowledge, uh, their understanding of reality, to make this world uh, full of uh, dignity, uh, beauty. And also we initiated this project to inculcate a environment of dialogue and mutual learning interfaith. Cultural learning is one of them. So uh, we meet every Sunday and uh, today is a very special topic uh, that is political violence. Uh, of course, uh, that is the very existential uh, problem or existential threat that we as a society has, you know, we are facing. But uh, it is very important to understand the nature, the reasons of political violence. So uh, today is a very important uh, topic and very uh, sensitive topic. So uh, giving a kind uh, uh, of very brief introduction of this theme. So let me in invite uh, uh, Professor Anand Kumar uh, Giri to kindly share his uh, thought and please introduce the theme of today's session. Anand Bhai, over to you. <laughs> thank you so much, dear Gandhi. And thank you, Professor Chatukulam, Dr. Manashi, Dr. Omar Aminati and all friends co-present. So it is a joy to learn with uh, 
professor chatukulam and uh, he writes so insightfully about contemporary challenges and what is so deeply insightful about his work is a very attentive empirical work as well as relating to uh, deeper reflections therefore while uh, the challenge of political violence in kerala and just the inhumanity and the gruesomeness of it which we may not realize and not only uh, in kerala but everywhere in india and the world today for example just to experience the nature of political violence in kerala i was in uh, kannur which is uh, a very unfortunate tragic you know epicenter of political feeling and violence and uh, my respected friend and peace activist father skaria kanur brought me to the house of a woman and uh, we had gone to meet her and uh, professor and father kalu was telling that how this women who is we don't her husband was a bus driver and uh, he had sympathy with rss and while driving the bus he was pulled out and brutally butchered and then uh, his son had come back home and right in front of his house his son was also you know brutally you know don away with and this house is just a you know two to three minutes work from the home of the present uh, chief minister of kerala senior vijayan and we know the difficult challenges of a uh, political feeling and violence and but father kalur was also telling me that how the killers themselves once they go to jail and once they come on bail so they are celebrated with garlands and and now we can relate it to the kind of celebration of the rapists and killers who were let loose in gujarat you know so this is the um, the, the challenge of bhavalan and uh, professor chatukulam links it to a very deep challenge banality of evil and what is banality of evil and it brings us to the deep and uh, perennial work of hana arendt the great uh, thinker and activist of 20th century and in her work on banality of evil especially reflecting upon the killing of the jews and others by the nazi killing machine and uh, one of them adolf uh, you know eichmann was caught and tried in israel and hana arendt uh, she went to jerusalem was part of the she took part uh, she witnessed the whole trial process and wrote a work called eichmann in jerusalem and then she challenges us to uh, address the problem of banality of evil by saying that eichmann the killer and uh, you know she he has killed and you know but, but in how do we punish him because the punishment you know he has killed and eichmann himself said that uh, in a very <laughs> difficult twist of argument <laughs> that touches upon moral and political philosophy eichmann says that i was doing my duty and uh, in a way can't say about performance of duty and i was doing my duty and here hana arend writes and uh, and then arend says as if uh, she is speaking to eichmann she is saying no kant does not say that while performing your duty you would have to be an executor of blind obedience so what arend is pointing to that this banality of evil in the sense that here is a person who is killing not only one but numerous millions of people but he is not at all reflecting upon his activity this unthinking and in a way uh, many of the political killers in a way they are like eichmann they are carrying out orders from another set of hierarchy or the killing regime and this link between killing and unthinking also becomes clear 
in a very important recent work by political scientist and theorist Nira Chandok, who in her book, The Violence in Our Bones, and this is the work which came out last year, 2021. She writes, individuals certainly kill if they form part of a crowd intent on murder. At such times, perfectly stable people can be swept away by torrents of hate and unthinking reaction. So I request you to relate Arendt's notion of unthinking and banality of evil as assault on thinking to what Professor Chandok is writing in these lines. But Professor Chandok also goes on to say that but violence is also a weapon of the last resort, the weapon of the weak, the dispossessed, and the weapon of those who have been subjected to overlapping injustices because power holders simply do not listen. So this is another side of political violence. You know, what we see sometimes in insurgencies, even what we call as Maoist violence today. So we would have to link it to the challenge of justice and injustice. About thinking and unthinking and what happens when one thinks. Now, Nir Chando, uh, she presents us the conversation between a reporter from BBC and one of the rapist and uh, killer of Nirvaya. And uh, you know about, uh, you, we have heard about the gruesome rape and murder of Nirvaya or killing of Nirvaya. And the BBC reporter in the conversation with the one of this uh, rapist and murderer, and um, he asks, and this man says that, okay, this girl should have known that you know, she should not have come out after nine. And even if she was raped, if she had not protested, that we would not have killed her. Now, why did she protest? Because she's a thinking person. She's a moral being. She cannot accept the violence against her body and soul. So therefore, the whole challenge of political violence, violence in many forms and banality of evil age, that violence is part of an assert of thinking. This is why Hannah Arendt, coming back to Haren, he challenges, she challenges us that today there is not only unthinking, but there is an assault on thinking. And we can look at that all party ideologies today. Now, they always assault on thinking and free thinking, and we would have to follow the party line or the state line. And linking it to uh, Kant's moral philosophy, and uh, Kant, for Arendt, Kant's moral philosophy is so closely bound up with Kant's man's faculty of judgment, which ruled out blind obedience. Arendt makes a distinction between political reason, practical reason, and obedience. And uh, Nira Chandak also, in her work on violence, she refers to Anna Arendt, and she says that with Arendt, we would have to learn how to make a distinction between power, strength, force, authority, and violence. And for Arendt, while violence works, the whole work of power is that it has a moral dimension. And Hara Arendt says, to have power is the ability to work in concert with each other. And reflecting upon that, our respected friend Mampala Rampele, who is the co-president of the Club of Rome, and she herself is a victim of political violence because almost 50 years ago, our, um, you know, she and her uh, friend and partner, Steve Biko, organized the Black Consciousness Movement against the apartheid regime. And Biko, Steve Biko was brutally murdered. And in a foreword to a book I am writing called Social Healing, what Mamphela Ramphele writes is that while it is helpful to think with Arendt 
that power, power is the ability to work in concert with each other. But then the question is far more beyond. You know? How do we really not only work with each other, but heal each other and, and kind of dream together, you know, just building on Mampele. So therefore, in the face of you know, political violence, and which manifests in very gruesome forms in contemporary Kerala, as in other parts of India and the world. So how do we address the challenge of violence? And always in the midst of violence, as the opening song from Tagore, Hingsara Unmatta Prithi, this world made with violence, how do we learn non-violence? And um, in a way, Professor Tatukulam's work on decentralization, in a way, decentralization is a step towards, you know, from violence to non-violence. And uh, I would conclude with this story from Mahabharata, where King Kaushika, you know, who was traveling and he was once uh, sleeping under a tree and uh, a bird, you know, was there and a little drop fell on Kausika's uh, head and he was so angry that uh, the bird was burned with the anger of this king. And then the king was moving and the king found a woman, you know, who was uh, the wife of a, a, a butcher and uh, he asked her something. And he was no, she was in no hurry to reply to the king and the king again showed anger. And then she said, do you think I am that bird that you can burn me with your anger? And then uh, the story goes, the king learns the art of non-violence from this butcher and his wife. In a way, this is the predicament before humanity today. In the world made with non-violence, how do we realize the limits of our own violence and learn you know, vision and practices of non-violence from seemingly, you know, uh, non-important sources like learning non-violence from a slaughterhouse. So, uh, thank you, dear friends, and with joy, we welcome Professor Chatukulam. Please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. Please. Yeah. Good afternoon to all. I would like to first uh, thank yeah, Professor uh, Adbigiri to organize this uh, lecture. I also would like uh, Needham, Dr. Needham, for uh, making a see, warm welcome to myself and uh, my researcher, uh, uh, Manishi Joseph. And I'm very happy in the sense that there, uh, the professor and the degree has already given a kind of a theoretical framework so that uh, it is actually, the, I would like to say that they are a professor and the degree and we benefited out of your uh, theoretical perspective of this, this platform to understand more on that. I would like to say that there one sentence as far as this is concerned, this is actually the political violence, as far as Kerala is concerned, it is a very, very uh, serious kind of concern, as far as the Kerala is concerned. And I also would like to mention that there, this is actually a kind of reflection of, of, uh, of, of agitated mind, of peace-loving a society, as far as this political violence and killing is concerned. And uh, yeah, this is actually this is kind of reflection as far as this this paper is concerned. And may I request, uh, yeah, Manshi, and she will then start. So our topic is uh, political killings through the lens of banality of evil. So first, we will be looking into the definition of political killings. It can be looked into like from two angles. Some define it as an extrajudicial killing in which uh, rulers or government authorities deliberately and un unlawfully kill their political opponents whom they perceive as a threat. It can be personally and politically. Uh, 
it is like whom they view as enemy to their party party ideology beliefs and concepts uh, police encounters uh, state and state sponsored murders happening in india also fall under the same category another angle is like some compare political killings to politicide that is like political mass murder in which a group of people are killed and targeted because of their hierarchical position or political opposition to the regime or the dominant groups at that time so this these kind of mass murders are executed by communists uh, mostly by communist regimes and brutal dictators across the world one thing that is common between this politicide and the extrajudicial killing is that both of them are performed in a very inhuman and uh, barbarous manner um now we are uh, looking into the political killings in kerala uh, kerala being a politically vibrant state it also has a characteristic of uh, adversarial and competitive strategies on political lines and as a result it has been a hot spot of political killings for decades and as a result uh, this uh, the rate of political killings and violence are increasing at an alarming rate and there have been numerous incidents in which all major political parties in the country including cpim bjp congress all of these parties major and minor political parties have resorted to the murder of opponents or uh, retaliatory serial killings uh, looking into some statistics um, like clashes between uh, rss and cpim alone in kerala have claimed over 300 lives since uh, 1969 and as per the latest figures available from the state police a total of 173 political murders happened in kerala between 2000 and 2016 and of these uh, cpim has around lost around 86 workers uh, bjp has lost 65 congress and ioml uh, together have lost 11 activists meanwhile one of the most uh, cold blooded political murders that kerala has witnessed is that of uh, tp chandrashekharan which took place in may 2012 uh, chandrashekharan was uh, formerly a member of the cpim he later left the party and formed a splinter party revolutionary marxist party and um, as his popularity began to rise in the communist stronghold of onjiam and vadigara the the communist party obviously was it with, with it and as a result uh, they had some sort of enmity with him so eventually he was hacked to death uh, he was stabbed uh, reportedly 51 times though the official leadership of the cpim denied that party had any role in the killing uh, the investigation into the murder proved that uh, the cpim the major leaders of the cpim had indeed a role behind it these are some news clippings uh, regarding the chandrashekharan murder case and some more statistics uh, from may 2016 to may 2021 that is during the first stint of the ldf government around uh, 32 political killings were reported and out of it with 12 took place in kannur on uh, november 15 2021 that is during the second stint of the ldf government uh, local rss activists were was killed uh, and in december 2021 a gruesome political murder took place uh, in alapura and the murdered were prominent workers of uh, bjp and sdpi and the most shocking fact is that these murders took place within a span of 12 hours these are the news clippings regarding the incident in which two people were killed in within a span of uh, 12 hours in kerala this is another incident which uh, took place in kerala in 2022 uh this took place uh, in a gap of 24 hours this also a similar case in which a cpm activist was uh, murdered by allegedly by bjp rss men uh while kannur in north kerala was dubbed as the epicenter of uh, political killings and attacks the recent rising tensions between the rss bjp and sdpi in palakkad and alappuzha signals a shift so previously the political rivalry was between the cpim and rss and it led to tensions in the state but 
In that recent times, the tension between SDPI and RSS is on the rise, and it is evident in the figures that from between February 2021 to April 2022, around four people lost their lives due to the political rivalry between these two parties. Uh, another important thing that triggers political violence in Kerala is the student politics. Apart from the mainstream political parties, uh, the student unions, uh, be it of the major or minor political parties, are turning the college campuses into killing fields. And they have, in a way, become torchbearers of anti democratic culture and violence. Kerala has a number of uh, examples in this regard. Uh, the Abhimanyu case uh, is one among them. Uh, those student politics is an integral part of campuses across India, and there have been strikes, occasional protests, and violence. We have never went into as violent as in the case of Kerala, though there may be some exceptions. Uh, uh, though though Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, they 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 have uh, left Bastion over the years, has often been described as a role model when it comes to student politics. Uh, it's interesting to note that SFI, which had a formidable influence in JNU that launched the political careers of top left leaders, including Prakash Karat, the former general secretary of CPIM, and uh, Sidaram Yachuri, the present general secretary. Despite uh, being the, why, why are they silent on the political violence and murders committed by the SFI in the campuses of Kerala in the name of student politics is a crucial question. And um, why are they mute spectators when the party men are busy uh, sponsoring cold-blooded murders? So this is like the JNU itself is one of the most diverse and inclusive campus that gives ample space to radical voices, not only from left movement, but across political stream. So as political leaders coming from such an institution, they have a greater role in suggesting to the state leadership and SFI in Kerala to adopt a JNU model in which students of opposite ideologies fight against each other on the basis of debates and intellectual deliberation and not through muscle power and violence. Uh, our main topic is to analyze the political killing through the lens of banality of evil. And this term banality of evil was coined by German American philosopher Hannah Arendt. In her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. Arendt's uh, fundamental thesis is that uh, ghastly crimes like Holocaust are not necessarily committed by psychopaths and socialists, but often by normal, sane, and ordinary human beings who perform their tasks with a bureaucratic diligence. So this is a book. Uh, again, her what, what she argues is that daughter's crimes like Holocaust or genocide are uh, not necessarily committed by psychopaths, but, but often by normal and sane ordinary human beings as part of their bureaucratic diligence. That is, in a way, she was arguing that people like Eichmann are simply carrying out their duties without evil intentions. Meanwhile, it is important to note that she never tried to downplay the guilt of Eichmann and repeatedly described him as a war criminal and concurred with his death sentence. So what Hannah, what Arendt is arguing is that Eichmann never realized what he was doing due to an inability to think from the standpoint of somebody else and lacking this particular cognitive ability, he committed crimes under circumstances that made it impossible for him to know or to feel that he was doing wrong. And she called these uh, collective characteristics as the banality of evil. So her main point is that can one do evil without being evil or evil deeds are performed without evil intentions? Uh, while analyzing the cold-blooded political killings in Kerala, anyone can cast doubt that whether the political parties or their loyalists or supporters have directly or indirectly found some inspiration in Hannah Arden's banality of evil. 
that is to justify the murders and killers carried out by them. And uh, in the case of Kerala, CPIM has shown uh, no reluctance in openly supporting and protecting its members who have executed political killings on behalf of the party. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, take the case with P.K. Kunjanantan of CPIM. He was convicted in the Chandrasekharan murder case. For many party workers and loyalists, uh, he was just a loyal supporter of the CPIM leadership, loyal party men. And when his party ordered him to carry out the political killing of a person whom they considered a renegade or a rebel, he just executed it. That is, he's necessarily not a bad person, but what he did was just to obey his party leadership. For the party and its people, uh, what, what he committed was an evil that was banal and not necessarily a crime. Uh, however, no one openly dubbed it as the banality of evil. In Kerala, as well as across India, uh, there is a trend that whenever political violence takes place, uh, the political parties or leaders assure the people involved gets complete support, which includes uh, compensation to families, uh, extra privileges in jails, payment of legal fees, bearing of the complete expense of families, even arranging marriages, and so on. A disturbing trend noticed among political parties in Kerala in particular, and India in general is that they are involved in the political patronization and offers financial and material perks to convicts, culprits, and their families. In a way, they get a heroic treatment for the cruel crimes they have committed. Such unethical uh, practice in a way suggests that party and its supporters are indirectly viewing politically sponsored killings as a banal evil and not pure evil. Uh, as, I, as I stated earlier, those who commit crimes are portrayed as heroes and not as villains. It's not just limited to one political party. It applies to all the political parties. And there is some general consensus, consensus that the number and intensity of the wrong and cruel deeds that one does to protect the interest of political party makes you a star and survivor within the party. There is no doubt that political killings in Kerala are a stain on the progressive politics and social harmony in the state. Kerala prides itself as a state with an enviable record of communal harmony and inclusive public action. Kerala did make significant gains in development indices despite a low economic base, mainly because political and civil society were invested in maintaining social peace and would jointly resist attempts to privilege communal identities over the collective self. The political violence and killings also denote a widening democratic deficit, not only within political and government institutions, but also within the Kerala society as a whole. Uh, the political killings are not just limited to Kerala. In India also, there are several incidents uh, regarding the same. In West Bengal, where the CPIM and left front remained in power for around 34 years was a hotbed of brutal political killings. D. Bandhav Padia in his article has mentioned about, he has, he has uh, pointed out some statistics that around 28,000 political murders were committed between 1977 and 19. 60s, 1996. Um, and uh, there is also in reports of violence between BJP and Trinamool Congress Party. A similar kind of uh, violence exists throughout India. Mainly after election results also, such uh, reports of political violence are widely reported. So the conclusion is that public will no longer tolerate such cold-blooded killings in the name of be it in the name of politics, religion, or hatred, especially in the post-pandemic and pandemic period, people are struggling to make ends meet. And the, honestly, nobody wants to be killed, nor want others to be butchered. And the concept of uh, banality of evil can never be justified, uh, be it in a political or a, a political killings. However, 
the main issue with it is that the political parties, be it in Kerala or in, as in India in general, are treating killings and violence of some objective to fulfill their best interest as banal evil and support the murderers as innocent lambs slaughtered for the better good. So political parties should stop treating murders as heroes and brand ambassadors of violence. When murdered human lives are reduced to numbers and denied justice, basic human rights, including the right to live life to the fullest and right for a dignified death are often trampled underfoot for selfish and cruel intentions. It in a way denotes the death of humanity in general. India also has a rich tradition and literature on peace and social harmony, right from the nonviolent speech by Mahatma Gandhi to the core tenets of Buddhism. And in the recent times, we also have great people like Dalai Lama, who constantly preaches that only through compassion and inner peace can one spread peace in the world. Also, it's wise to remember the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who said, when, when there is injustice, invariably peace becomes a casualty. Uh, more discussions on Hannah Arden's concept of banal evil in the context of political killings and violence needs to emerge to deconstruct the evil of political and a political mass murders across the world. Thank you. Hello, Anantha, are you there? You can invite the next speaker. Yes, hello. So thank you, Dr. Manushi and uh, Professor Chatukulam uh, for your presentation. Now I invite Dr. Umar, please, to kindly share his thoughts. Dr. Umar. Thank you, Professor Josh Chapukulam and Dr. Manasi for this presentation that is so enlightening, wonderful. It's a privilege listening to it. So I'd like to try an anecdote. My uncle uh, who was studying uh, for his uh, speech and hearing course in UP and later in Bangalore, he came back to Kerala and told us that Kerala actually is a piece of heaven. It's such a peaceful place. And the another anecdote is that I have a colleague, uh, she has a young son, and uh, she tells me that uh, she has bought her son numerous toys, but he only plays with the gun. This child has some problem, whichever... Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah whichever to, to toy he's given, he plays only with the gun. Uh, so, uh, so today, the feminist movements had a major role in tackling toxic masculinity all over the world. A situation similar to 1914 and 1939 is there in Ukraine, Syria, all over the world. But what is preventing the world into spiraling into mass violence is the emergence of the feminist movements against toxic masculinity on a universal scale. So structural issues of violence have to be addressed. Peace has to be actively created, like Lermontov says, and not in a passive manner. And there were these great consciousness programmers. I would call them consciousness programmers, like the great Sri Narayana Guru, Mahatma Iyengali, Chattami Swamigal from Kerala, who actually changed the consciousness of a very violent place, like Kerala, which Swami Vivekananda called a madhouse. And uh, the communist movement in Kerala is a continuation of this great renaissance movement and uh, addressing structural violence which is often invisible was given priority over empirical violence so in malayalam there is a saying that even if my mother is beaten we can debate over that so violence is today the absolute you cannot debate about violence whether it is good or bad it is the most despicable most disgusting thing 
at the same time structural violence we seldom noticed if colonial reports on india are read today they say that violence on a psychotic scale is absent in india unlike in europe but today we have to be on the alert about that kind of violence emerging in our peaceful country so slavoj zizek makes a very controversial comment he says that gandhi was more violent than hitler how because gandhi changed the system hitler was this megalomaniac who could not change anything even in his own country so changing the system structurally is what matters how violence can be ended so there is a dark web of philosophy in germany especially including frederick nietzsche which hanna arend is addressing through her jewish semitic logic where the meek shall inherit the earth but today a crisis is emerging where we believe that only the strong will inherit the earth so today uh, a clergyman friend he told me uh, that uh, christ has to be compared to tiger you know but we know christ as the son of god who bore unbearable pain and died on the cross with the humans so that is the uh, semitic idea against nazism so we have to be on the alert of such ideas being hijacked so the semitic christian ethos have a major role in kerala in solving all crises including violence so uh i would like to conclude my remarks thank you so much professor jatukula and dr manasi for this enlightening talk thank you thank you so much uh, dr umar you have really brought uh, another set of very deep challenges thank you so now let us continue our conversations so we would uh, we request uh, questions comments and reflections please and i would request professor chatukulam and dr manasi to kindly take note of it including the comments of dr umar and come towards the end so friends i see sudha in our mix sudha please begin your thoughts uh and and i can not please give me some more time to observe okay, okay. <laughs> and then uh, other friends please dr sek kasip dr kalpana dr amir dr sasi devi yeah dr anand giri what i will do uh, if you, if you permit uh, i can also give see some some issues raised by the discussion i can i can sure, sure. yes okay. please. yes please see, i i would like to uh, thank you for the uh, excellent a uh, comments made by the discussion professor you know you see no doubt uh, see kerala uh, one can say that there is a very peaceful place no doubt at all and that also in our presentation man she mentioned that there that aspect as far as the you see there is no mass violence of course you are very right the structure of violence has been answered to different social reform movement Uh, including the land reforms um, and other kind of distribution of public assets to certain sec certain sections of the society and the public action and manch you also mentioned that there as far as the communal uh, tensions and communal conflicts are concerned kerala is relatively free and because uh, because of kind of is a kind of Uh, the kind of mutual understanding of the different uh, societies in kerala uh, of course you mentioned that they are from a mad house uh, it is actually to become a god's own country and no doubt at all that part is there but you see the 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 important point is that there uh, the political violence 
uh, in, uh, the terms in terms of number and in terms of its dimensions in the process. This is one important aspect. And number two, the point is that there is the see, see, as far as see, we mentioned that there the the, the murder of uh, Mr. A particular see, patients, TP Chandrasekhar's case is there. And people are fully aware that there they could identify that there, these are the people behind this murder. And police could do some kind of a work and they put it in the jail for a period of time and all things there. The point is that there, you see, these people, they are coming from the jail. Sometimes it may be in parole. And meanwhile, what happened? The same political party is to issue the tickets to them to conduct in the elections, of course. And they got elected. And they got elected. This is important point, is that there? And got elected in the in the in a kind of mass, it's a kind of a big margin in that particular region. And nobody is treating that they're okay. These person, they could identify that they're okay, they did this such and such murder as far as that particular case is concerned. It is Media could identify, police could identify, local people could identify, the, the, the regional, all the political parties could identify. These are the people behind this. In spite of that, see, they are got elected. This is important point is that. You see, the point is that they're not only that particular party is concerned, but in Kerala, by and large, large sections of the society, they feel that there, this is something, there is no other way we have to, understand the situation, it is nothing but the banality of evil. Banality of evil. They know that they are, they are very nice people. Of course, they are very nice people in the personal level. They are not giving any kind of a, see, kind of a wrong things to others. Only thing is that they are these, they are just identifying certain persons and they have no other quarrel. Some party members and party functionaries are identifying to do that kind of a work and they are doing. And at the same time, not only the political parties of the respective political parties, the point is that they're by and large, the large sections of the society, and they also in a position do that, they, they are not ready to punish these people. They all feel that there, this is nothing but the penalty of evil. This is as far as this is, this is more serious issue as far as Kerala is concerned. And number two, you rightly mentioned that they are uh, in the, in the, the very particularly in the, in the, actually the religious leaders, including the Christian leaders and the public intellectuals. As far as these political killings are concerned, we would like to say that they would like to register that there the public intellectuals in Kerala by and large and the religious leaders in Kerala by and large, they are keeping a kind of a calculated neutrality and silence as far as this killing is concerned. This is what they're the more concerned as far as this killing is concerned and things there. And, and second point, we all talk about the Kerala model of development that is right in terms of the very poor social, the, the, the agriculture, the, the, the basic things their industry and agriculture background, Kerala could achieve a kind of a social indicators that, that can be compared to the any part of the Western developed world. But at the same time, the point is that there, the, the, the value of democracy, the, the, the degree of democracy, I, we feel that there, there is a serious issues concerned there, that is the deficit of democratic values and democracy as a whole. This is also another serious issue. And there may be some kind of correlation one can establish the democratic deficit which is taking, which is in Kerala and this kind of uh, political murder and political killing in, in Kerala. That is also a point one has to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Katukulam. And uh, your reflection also brings us to another challenge. And you know, the, the dark side uh, of uh, Kerala, the so-called celebrated uh, Kerala model of development. What Dr. Umar is pointing to kind of peaceful situation, but you know, what is really lurking behind it? And another, aspect of that is also violence against women, you know, and uh, in Kerala, gender violence and uh, linking it to the question of structural violence then and patriarchy. But Dr. Umar was saying that how feminist movement 
is really challenged against toxic masculinity. But what is the you know nature of uh, women's movement in Kerala? If we look at politics, you know the political model of development. In C and uh, Dr. Umar, you mentioned that communist movement is a continuation of Kerala Renaissance movement. But what is the place of women? Where are the women political leaders? And you know, and uh, so and also the question of dowry in Kerala society and. Uh, so the kind of work it needs to be done. So we would continue this conversation, some of these points. Now, more thoughts, please. Uh, hi, good evening. Hello, good evening. Yeah, I'm Amir from Srinagar. Yes, please open your video and share your thoughts. <laughs> oh, am I, actually, I, I'm attending my mother here. She's okay, currently... please. Oh, so, hi, hi, Amir. Salam. Uh, like <laughs> Lovely to see you. Amir is a doctoral student at Central University of Kerala, my dear friend. Please yeah. go ahead. Yes. Central University of Kashmir. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, why? <laughs> Sorry. And interest, interestingly, I am doing my PhD on Hannah Arendt. Oh! Uh, yeah. you know. So I'm basically trying to look at how she reconceptualizes the relation between power and violence and how we can invoke her in contemporary India. Hello? Yes, hello, Amir. Yes, please. Please go mm -hmm. on. Yes. So I was just listening to this presentation earlier. So I think... Hannah Arendt has a very strong argument regarding this distinction between power and violence because the, this point has also been reiterated by prophets and philosophers, though readily forgotten by some believers. And it goes to the credit of Arendt in modern times to argue for this in a world where few contest the dogma of might is right. And I think one key distinction is that she was, re she was actually arguing that power and violence are opposites. Her argument was not like Gandhi's for nonviolence, but an argument for power, which is most powerful when it is nonviolent. So, and uh, particularly for people like us who live in a place which has seen violence all through these years, and where we are seeing that, uh, where it is assumed that those with the biggest armies or arsenals or the ultimate weapon are the ones with power or even superpower, and where it is assumed that power means the capacity to rule over others. So I think our distinction is hard to understand and its implications hard to imagine in places like Kashmir. And also uh, regarding the banality of evil, uh, which was raised in uh, the presentation, the, uh, she, um, the presenter, she talked about the bureaucrats. So the most, sin of most careerist politicians and bureaucrats is that they fail to think and take responsibility for their complicity in evil. Uh, uh, they help, actually they help perpetuate and cite rules of the game in their defense. So the question is that isn't one guilty if one's job is linked to killing, maiming people, imprisoning someone for the sake of these nameless ideologies. So I think it was really a good lecture, very you know, helpful for me especially. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amir. I hope you can also, after a few minutes, tell us a little more about the nature of political violence in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe you can think a little bit. We would like to hear more from you. Okay. And uh, in the meantime, we have uh, Suresh. Uh, Suresh, you have posted some thoughts in chat box. Would you like to raise these questions, please, yourself, very quickly? 
Okay, sir. And please open your video so that we can see you. Yes. Okay. Hello. Can you yes. hear me, sir? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have some doubt and I would like to add something. For example, in this, uh, the presentation is very good and to congratulate to Dr. Manzi. Uh, but the historical point is not uh, included in the political violence in Kerala, one thing. And uh, it is not uh, analyzed. What are the reasons for political killing? Uh, another thing, the recent political killings are uh, not analyzed. I think uh, the recent political killing is not analyzed here because the recent one is the murder of uh, the BJP worker at the SPPI focus. It is not uh, uh, deeply analyzed. And another thing in Kerala, the major political violence happened in Kanur and Nadabur area. It is basically the CPI workers and the uh, BJP workers. Another thing, the campus politics, the violence in campus politics is started. Uh, uh, it has also a historical importance. It is not mentioned here. I think these historical aspects uh, would cover. It is better to understand the, the political violence and uh, violence of Kerala. And uh, uh, we can analyze it based on this thing. I, 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 I think that's what that is. Thank you, Suresh. And uh, I request Professor uh, Chatukulam and Manasi to speak about it a little later. So further thoughts, please. I invite uh, Minati, please. Hello, hope I'm audible. Yes, yes please. Good evening, everyone. First, I would like to thank Professor Jos Chatakulam, Dr. Manasi Ma'am, and Dr. Umar Rahmat for very insightful and uh, political, I mean, very deep presentation. Um, so as they were telling about the Kerala's political scenario and political healing, so one thing was coming to me, as Anantabhai was mentioning, it is not only in Kerala, we see the reflections of every state, uh, state's political violence in our own state. I mean, uh, in Odisha, where I live in Bangalore, in Karnataka, we can see the violence, no? They killed so many rational thinkers, like uh, Kalburji, Govind Bansari, uh, then uh, this uh, Gauri Lankesh, and all these things they did. Actually, every peaceful place has turned violent now. You can tell even, no, to the grassroots level, it has gone. There will be election in Delhi, but there will be fight in the villages among no, very close friends, families, and relatives. It is penetrated to the grassroots level. You know, they don't see that uh, that old values, everything is lost on this political. The first thing comes, there is division for the political parties, which political party you support, which you don't. That is uh, that has happened. And that the students things they were taking, talking about student politics. In my college days, it is two decades ago. Also, we find that time itself in the smaller places also, there was a lot of violence during the election time. Even in even the campus elections, and you always find there will be sponsored or they will be mentored by the political parties who have. I mean, they try to their um, get through the, the students to get their interest. So, and for this, my observation was the political violence is treated as the violence are treated as heroes. That is, we have. It is in our people's psyche that we are conditioned to believe that, no, like history always glorifies the heroes who have killed, who have murdered, who have conquered. So that is also somehow, no, that stream flows to the modern civilization also. I feel that. And uh, that Dr. Umar Ahmed was telling about consciousness program. That is a very good point. Actually, some ISKCON and all, they have started many programs for children where no, they will be just uh, be in bliss, happiness, and uh, learn so many things around them, how to be kind, compassionate, all these things. But the challenge is how to maintain that thin line between making them spiritual 
or not to go towards the religious extremism. I feel that is the challenge. You initially you see very good motive of doing that thing, but slowly later it found it has become the religious uh, ex extremist. They go towards that, and um, yes about that most assaults happen in north we see in political raids what they do their easy target is the females they do some sexual assault and the reason is found by the psychologist by the researchers all are politically motivated or the domination so these are the things i had to share and one more thing also i had one we should talk not only talk about the active violence you should talk about the passive violence you know not only we think about what happens directly, but indirectly also, if you uh, support a political party or you show your ideology, what type of things happens in a society? That also we should talk about. So again, I will ask uh, uh, Professor Chattakulam, I mean, how does this development and violence, both are, whether it is related, whether the more developed ones will have less violence, or whether is there any relationship between them? And thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Minati. And just one leaking thought about different kinds of violence. Not only passive violence, but also violence through speech. And here we should not forget that Judith Butler, uh, you know, all friends. Uh, she is also a very important uh, political thinker. And in a way, she follows a bit of uh, the path of Hannah Arendt. She has uh, reflected on Hannah Arendt. She has a book that I was reading this morning called Excitable Speech. And if we look at that how violence, political violence, and uh, you know, it's being cultivated, it's formed through this kind of speech, hateful speech and you demonize another person and uh, and therefore there's a thin line between free speech and, and hatred and murder. And what Butler is saying that we must be attentive to, very attentive to the words that we use and you know, so therefore that is also another kind of very deep structural violence that we are confronting. So moving on, further thought please. Sudha, uh, you can kindly share some thoughts now. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much uh, for very insightful uh, discussions. I thank all the speakers here, including uh, Miniti, who really brought out certain uh, very you know, <laughs> uh, important uh, insights also. Uh, what I think, uh, yeah, this is something very deep. It's not just, um, it's very important to understand why this violence happens. Where does it sprout from? Violence, even many a time, I also have been thinking of this. Uh, uh, because, uh, of course, uh, like here, if it comes to the uh, simple examples, like even in Karnataka, now the political violence is not between two parties. It is basically to brand one party or the other, killing the same party person and blaming the other, other party. It's just for the political gain. This is, this is much more, I don't know what to call this, such an evil, you know, to, get, uh, to gain political importance using their own workers. This, to that extent, our youth are getting into, I mean, you know, will be like, uh, they have become, uh, what do you call that, like, uh, or sacrificial goats, in fact. So this kind of politics is, uh, you know, now it is increasing everywhere. Um, I just wonder why, where, where are we as a human being, do we carry that uh, violent, uh, DNA within us are we still have we not evolved or still we are in evolving stage you know I really go to the depth of this I don't know whether you know this I'll get an answer for this but uh, really are we I mean uh, where is this violence is coming from and once we we always you know try uh, tend to think that we are peaceful 
uh, we are uh, basically uh, you know peaceful and non violent beings but some way are we carrying some way from uh, you know uh, what do you call that uh, or uh, <laughs> other uh, evolving stage some species to human species are we carrying from reptiles something still we are not at uh, you know left that kind of a poison within us uh, so i i don't know, i don't have answers for this but just this is my just thinking about so the uh, because whatever you see in the society it's a, it's a structural violence certainly it's a structural violence we are not at we are not addressed we have not addressed the structural violence and especially the masculine and you know uh, the toxic masculine power the power which tries to control tries to that that leads to violence so what is that masculinity you know I, i don't say like you know feminists have to do it's basically the human tendency why it's happening in that way even in kerala of course i have some kind of understanding that though it is so developed in all other sense like you know but there is a deep inside there's a very strong patriarchy works i i don't i mean Uh, it, it doesn't mean that it is here it's not here it is there it's everywhere in fact globally it is there you could see the kind of violence in the name of war it's name of the anything whatever is happening around the world it's not just india or not just in one place so it's it, there is something deep uh, i think we need to probe in much more into the cause of violence uh, whether it is deeply kind of uh, yeah you know where does it coming from and uh, so that is the cause for the like you know structural violence which i look at uh, the thing sorry i'm just you know uh, uh, my thank thoughts you. are just flowing sorry thank yeah you thank, you. thank you thank you now gyan lui ji please thank you very much i had some problems unfortunately i did not uh, receive the invitation so that i have to see the, the the exposition before i can speak i only saw that there is uh, the meeting only now unfortunately and so i linked as soon as possible but unfortunately i, I lost the exposition i will uh, uh, listen at it and uh, i will let you know what my observations are i I'm really very very sorry. I do not know what happened. I have nothing in my email. So I am sorry. I apologize. Thank you very much, but I will do. I will do all. I am very interested in the question and in the problems which were dealt with during the discussion and in the argument of the exposition. I thank you very much. I'm deeply sorry really. I am sorry it has not reached you in time. So we have uh, Motilal Sharma ji from Pokhara, Nepal. So Motilal bhai, some thoughts from you, please. And any other friend who would like to raise a thought, please do share. Motilal bhai. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> Tuli Didi, please. Uh, please unmute yourself yeah thank you antavai and uh, my hearty regards to all my elders and my friends my view here is uh, we should be aware human it is a human tendency to violent uh, to be violent from the very beginning from the birth Uh, of this earth, uh, the creation, violence has started. So we cannot eradicate it uh, totally uh, from this earth. To um, come out of this, we everyone, every person, they should be. Uh, I mean, everyone, every each and every soul, each and every person in this earth should be. aware that i am violent i am becoming violent the moment one is aware that awareness transfers to the other and like 
that it transfers to another, another, and in that way, in that respect, in that process, the whole world will be out of violence. This is my view. Maybe I am wrong. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you to Lididi and friends. So we are slowly being embraced by the blessings of time. So now I request uh, Professor Chatukulam and uh, Dr. Manasi to think with some of the questions raised. So Professor Chatukulam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. First, uh, yeah, I will try to answer some of the questions and some of the questions I may not be in a position, myself and Manasi may not be in a position to raise. These are the serious issues, very serious issues. I do agree that there, this paper needs a little more historical uh, the perspective. One has to look into that, the historical background of how the, the political violences emerged and developed in the context of Kerala. That part we have, we have to look into something more serious. I do agree that. But the point is that there, as far as the STPI and BJP, uh, the conflict and the murder of the STPI candidates and the BJP candidates very recently that we have already covered in this, uh, this paper. This paper that is there. And of course the students, uh, students uh, see violence in the, in the colleges and the universities. And I would like to say that there I can also do a little bit kind of a mapping as far as the Kerala uh, universities and colleges are concerned. And some colleges are fully controlled by a particular student's front, say it SFI. If that is the case there, and uh, see other students' unions are not getting any chance even to submit the nomination for the student the elections. This is a situation there. And some other colleges, what happened, universities, it is under the control of another student front. It may be uh, ABBP or it may be a student union affiliated to some regional political parties or the Congress party. And that political uh, students union is very strong. That students union, they don't give any kind of freedom chance to other political unions to function within that. A kind of complete kind of, uh, the, a kind of undemocratic uh, political culture which is prevailing in the majority of the universities and colleges in Kerala. I would like to say that there even principals and vice chancellors are helpless in this case. This is one aspect. And number two, but always there is no guarantee that there is the kind of the violence may take place. It is not in connection with the college union election or some other things. The point is that they're almost a peaceful way the college is functioning. Suddenly something may happen, start maybe very kind of silly issues. And within one day, in the same day in the evening, a political murder may take place in the college. This is there. This is situation is there. I would like to say that there, when you compare to other uh, states and uh, this much of political violence in the universities and colleges are relatively very high as far as Kerala is concerned. This is one aspect. But that, that also one has to look, I do agree that there one has to look the historical uh, the, the background and reasons for that. That is actually the paper needs a little bit kind of uh, rework on that particular aspect. I also would like to say that there is the kind of not only the, this kind of violence, the passive violence. And uh, Professor and the Giri mentioned that there, of course, we have a, some language. We say that there is a, it is, it is not parliamentary. They say they, it is not a parliamentary word, parliamentary language. But apart from that, definitely we have to be work on the what type of language, very important. Professor Giri, you mentioned that language the guest states, the metaphor, uh, the stories, then the body language. These are, these are very, very serious issues. We have to work a lot as far as the language part is concerned when you address the issue of political murder and political violence. Language uh, is, is very, very important. You mentioned about the hate speech, uh, body language, guest states, then the metaphor, the stories. Can the can we is, this is can really, we one has to look into that, this aspect. Uh, there is some disturbance, please. Yeah. 
then it is mentioned that there you see uh, there may be some correlation between the the, the the development and violence it's a very interesting uh, issue one has to look into that i feel that there there are some relations between the 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 the, the development what type of development that is more important and the, and the and the relationship with the violence one has to look into that yeah then it mentioned that there you see the Karnataka situation also there in Kerala also in other parts also so there it is not that the political violence between two 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 rival political parties even within within the within the political parties sometimes calculated kind of a murder is taking place and for accusing the other political parties and getting some kind of a political mileage or benefit out of it during the elections or some kind of a political campaign that is also which is taking place there see the point is that there when you mentioned about the violence uh, the the other parts uh, of the country very particularly when mentioned about the violence in uh, in orissa in uh, in violence in delhi uh, the, the the political violence and political killing see the point is that there uh, that is something different as far as the kerala violence which we are trying to talk on this particular uh, the issue, but the point is that there, that is not violence related to a election campaign. A violence is related to a particular kind of issue. The point is that there you feel that there everything is calm and quiet. Everything is there, and there is no clash at all. And nobody can identify there is any clash. Things there, things are moving so peaceful in the, that kind of situation in a particular village or particular region. What happened? It may start as a very, very small, minute issues within a period of between uh, within a period of say five to six hours. It it develops in such a fashion, and finally it will develop as uh, it will develop into a kind of a political murder. And political murder in the sense that they are and the person who are murdered, not that much of 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 a kind of a aggressive person. He may be a very peace loving person, but he is targeted. And the point is that their simply reason is that he or he is belong to another political party and targeted him and that kind of a targeted kind of a killing and murder. And the next day within 34 hours, that is what Mansi mentioned that they're within, within uh, 12 hours, what happened? The, the, the other locality, not in that locality, in some other locality, uh, is a man may be killed from a different political party. These kind of a particular kind of a political murder and political killing which is taking place in Kerala. And that needs a different kind of see, see analysis and understanding the situation, how it develops. In the, and particularly, uh, they mentioned that there are a particular political killing in a particular region, in particularly in the Kanu and that part, particularly that part. So the point, apart from that, they are and and there is no there is no way to how to explain the situations there situations there, and not only that there the, the the kind of glorifications of of these things. Apart from that, the point is that there the person who who identified is the person who was in jail, and he came out from parel and he got elected, uh, and he become uh, the municipal chairman of a particular municipality. And another person, he's also and uh, as a person who involved in the murder, and uh, he also came from jail and contested in the election. He got elected from the district panchayat president, and and because of uh, other pressures, other other legal proceedings, both of them had to resign from that post. The point is that there, and everybody is trying to justify uh, this kind of a political killing, and and uh, you see the. What we can say that there we would like to say this we can understand by mainly taking this this concept of banality of evil and we would try to uh, to to analyze the, the Kerala pattern of political killing and political murder by taking the concept and pieces of uh, Anna Arendt of the the banality of evil. Yeah. These are some of the uh, things. I think I, I have answered almost all, all questions. And basically, Bacon, that there, you mentioned that they're okay. We feel that there we are by, by, by nature. And we, we, feel, we can feel that they're okay. We are also violent. And there should be some kind of a strategies to address 
the, the, the kind of violence within, within our side. And that also part also one has to develop how to, how to say uh, the, the, the arrest, these kind of issues as far as the, the murder and violence and very particularly the, the political killing and political murder and very particularly in the context of care. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tapikulam. And uh, again, thank you for high, emphasizing the need to acknowledge banality of evil. In a way, what is banality of evil? It is also linked to a process of normalization. Correct, correct. And therefore, banality of evil has to be linked to the whole question of the normal and how we are living in a condition where it is deeply pathological is being produced as normal. And, uh, and what is evil? And I am remembering a very deep conversation I had with a theologian from Switzerland who was at Berlin in 2006 when I was visiting. And as a theologian, and Dr. Umar has also brought the challenge of religion and theology, for example, when some Christian priests are trying to reinterpret Jesus not as lamb, but as tiger. Now, what professor, um, this theologian told me as a scholar of evil, that what is evil? Though evil is in a way, depends upon your context, you know, like for a killer, you know, and his supporters, his killing is no evil. That is how it becomes penal. But this theologian is saying, and that is so deep that evil is that causes harm. But how do you understand harm? From the perspective of victims. Therefore, it is not a question of relativity of evil. It is not just because you killed my party member and I killed you. But how do we understand the harm that is being done to the victims and his family and circumstances? Therefore, this whole challenge of banality of evil challenges us to really acknowledge the many processes of normalization in which we accept evil as normal and how we free ourselves from this process of normalization. And one way is to identify with the victims of evil. And once we start identifying, and how do we identify? By putting ourselves in that suit as if I am being killed, my child, my family members are being killed. How do I feel if I put myself in the position of Chandrasekhar? So thank you, Professor Chatukulam and all friends for being co-present. Yeah, but Professor Ante, uh, see, Professor Giri, I will take only one minute. See, you raised a question, after all, what is the banality of evil? You see, we discussed in our local language, how to translate this banality of evil in Malayalam. And you are very right, an excellent explanation what you did. I would like to appreciate you. You see, the point is that the evil means in Malayalam, tinma, evil, evil is evil. You can know that there. You see, banality, we have a Malayalam word, it is samanya valkaranam. Samanya valkaranam. Tinma yuda samanya valkaranam. That means, we all know that there that is evil, evil, but that evil trying to trying to justify it, some kind of a normalizing the situations and justifying it. That is what their samanya valkaranam. You know that may be a Sanskrit word. You can understand the samanya valkaranam. It is what there. It is actually the people know it's an evil, but that evil they are justifying. My point is that they're not only as for the political killing is concerned in the Kerala society, what happened, what you mentioned that there the, the gender issues we raised that day. Of course, we have a uh, issue is there on gender. People say that there are paradox of gender. 
Now, what happened in the things there in the local uh, language? They also would like to say that there, this is also, uh, they accept that there is a kind of a evil, but that evil also trying to justify it. Some annual karanam is also taking place. Another point is corruption. Uh, people are people are in a position to say that their political party, there is corruption is there. And there are corruption at different levels, say bureaucratic corruption and political corruptions. But the point is that they're there also trying to dare the banality of evil. The people know that their corruption is evil, but it is also trying to justify some annual karanam is there. And this is a kind of situation is there, not only in the political killings as for the banality of evil is concerned, even all other evils as for the Kerala society is concerned, it reached in such a fashion that there is some annual karanam, is some kind of uh, normalizing, accepting that there is a part of normal and accepting is a part of, it is not that merely institutionalization of corruption is not that there, it is beyond that, it is beyond that. You are very right, I would like to appreciate again what you mentioned, you raised a question, what is after all the banality of evil? The banality of evil, it is also there very much there. What you mentioned, the pathology of the Kerala society, one has to apply this concept of banality of evil when you get it that they are more understanding as far as that present contemporary Kerala society is concerned. Thank you, Professor Giri, for giving us that chance to think in that line. Thank you, Professor Chakrikulam. And just one quick linking is that in this tradition of thinking, along with Hannah Arendt and Judith Butler, we can also bring Jürgen Habermas, who talks about justification yeah. and how, but this justification is not just self-justification, but the challenge of mutual justification. Societal, yes. societal kind of things. And, yes, yeah. and then moving beyond a pathological justification, to a moral justification. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that, you know, though it is not at the ground today, but this yeah. is kind of the horizon we should aim at. Yeah. But another uh, student of Habermas is Axel and colleague of Habermas is Axel Hanep from the critical school of Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. In 15 years ago, his book, Disrespect, is really Disrespect. It, it pointing to in that direction where he is bringing the crucial of the normal and the pathological. And what is pathological for him, and which links to the question of evil, that pathological is anything that obstructs our possibility of self-growth. Yeah. And not, not only self-growth, but self-existence, that my very existence is being killed because I am considered that I do not belong to the right group or I belong to another. So we'll continue this conversation. Now I invite Minot. And there is also a request uh, that Tamil also, there may be a, a equivalent word of banality of evil. In Oriya also, there may be a banality of evil. All mm -hmm. in Kannada also, there may be a banality of evil. That is also an interesting point there. We have to try to find out out there the local language, uh, local idiom, as far as the banality of evil is concerned. That is what you raised. What is the banality of evil? How a Canadian could 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 contextualize this banality of evil in the in the local uh, the the yeah but, uh, so it's, thank you thank you now Minati please shall I proceed to vote of thanks on the way yes please yeah. I Minati Pradhan on you behalf can switch of on your video if yeah. possible. Oh, fine. <laughs> Hi, I'm Minati Pradhan on behalf of Sodhya Sajakra and the Vishwanidam Center for Asian Blue I thank our two days chief speaker, Professor Josh Chattakulam, for his very deliberate, very insightful, and uh, very enlightening session about the political killings in Kerala. Thank you so much, sir. And I thank Dr. Manishi also for our very insightful presentation. and. Um, and bringing out various inside Kerala things to to us. So thank you, Manasi Madam. I I like I would like to thank our moderator and mentor, Professor Anand Kumar Giri, for arranging this type of webinar for us to learn and get enlightened by the different subjects. Thank you, Anandvai. I would like to thank Dr. Umar Ahmad 
as a discussant he brought up very important issues and uh, you know we need to further cultivate on those uh, points thank you dr umar ahmed sir and i would like to thank all the participants like uh, madam amir and suresh kulangar for bringing out uh, their questions and sharing their views uh, it was very lively thank you both i would like to thank our dear sudhari diman for being present with us today and sharing her very insightful things thank you sudha ma'am yeah, so really very insightful i would also like to sudha reddy yes yeah. I, i would like to i would like to thank uh, ganluji ji as I always he used to be present from the beginning today he was little late but still i uh, we appreciate his being present with us and um, madam samhita das for their uh, opinions and um, at the last not the least i would like to thank our convener randhir kumar gautam for planning and executing everything so diligently so thank you randhir and um, i would like to thank all our facebook um, participants and the zoom platform participants to being present with us and at the last please pardon me if i forgotten anybody's name i really thank from the bottom of my heart for being present with us thank you all